In today's video, I'm going to show you how to blend two photos together in Photoshop. This is mainly intended if you have a star tracker and you want to do Milky Way photography where you take a long exposure for the foreground and a long exposure for the sky. Of course, you can always do something different, but for me that works really well. And we are going to be using the Lumenzia uh, plugin today for Photoshop. This is one of a few options out there that works quite well. And I've gotten a lot of requests over the past couple months on looking at some different Luminosity Mask software. So I thought we'd take a look at Greg Benz's option today. First though, let's head over to Bridge and get started. And there's also something else I want to show you because one of my biggest rules of astrophotography is capturing as much light as possible. For me and my camera and a lot of others, this is going to give you great results. For example, in this photo, it's actually not that long. It's about three minutes. But even at three minutes, if I bring up the exposure, you can see we've got a lot of detail here in the trees. I mean, it's still kind of grainy because it was really dark. All things considered, that looks really nice. And that's why, again, one of my number one tips is to shoot three, four, five, maybe even longer minutes uh, to get great exposures at night. However, in some scenarios, that might not work that well. For example, this photo here was taken with a almost five minute long exposure, f2.8. That should be capturing a lot of light and therefore it should be a nice clean photo. Watch what happens when we bring up the exposure though. There's still a lot of this purple glow, which is pretty common on most DSLRs. And this is a Nikon camera, I should mention. And if we zoom in, you can see it's just covered in hot pixels. So this is something you gotta think about. The longer your shutter speed is, the more hot pixels are gonna be generated by your camera's sensor. And if we look up at the top here, we'll notice this is a Nikon D7200. And unfortunately, a lot of the crop sensor cameras, because the sensor is physically smaller, that tends to cause some problems for astrophotography, especially because of the fact that it's a DSLR and it wasn't really built for this kind of work. So for those of you that are going to be using a crop sensor camera and shooting long exposures like I recommend, you might start running into a problem like this where you get tons of hot pixels and even some purple glow. If you do happen to run into this, then I'd recommend turning on long exposure noise reduction. You should be able to find this in your camera's menu system. Don't confuse it though for high ISO noise reduction. That's useless, don't even worry about that. Again, we're looking for long exposure noise reduction. Once you enable long exposure noise reduction, in this case, if this was almost a five minute long photo, after this photo completed, the camera would take its own dark frame for an equal amount of time, in this case, 287 seconds, where no light would reach the sensor. This would allow it to map out all of the hot pixels and then remove them from the final image. And in this case, I don't think the photographer used long exposure noise reduction, or if he did, the camera just wasn't implementing it correctly. Because I know on my Nikon D750 and D780, when I turn it on, I don't have any hot pixels to worry about after the fact. And I know we're going off kind of on a tangent there, but this is really important because in order to get the best results out of your camera, you need to know how your camera performs. And that's why I always recommend you always go out and test it, Try different camera settings, turn on long exposure noise reduction, turn it off. Make sure you note down which exposures are which, that way you know when you get back to the computer. And even if you spend a whole good night just trying different camera settings and different uh, other settings, you might realize what works and what doesn't, so you can get better results moving forward with your camera. Getting back on track, this photo was taken with my Nikon D750 a couple years ago. Again, a long exposure of, in this case, three minutes, got me enough detail so that way we can pull out some more of the branches and everything else. So the first thing I'm going to do in this case is just some basic adjustments here in Adobe Camera Raw. If you don't have Photoshop and Camera Raw, I'd recommend getting them. It's really good software, especially for this kind of work. And that's what I recommend most people use. You can try Affinity Photo or some of the other applications, but a lot of the stuff is just hard to translate to there. And what I'm doing right now is just kind of looking over the image, adjusting the sliders until it looks about the way I want. In this case, I think that looks really nice. If I'm happy with these results here, then we have to look at our Star Trek photo, which I took right here. This was taken with my SkyGuider Pro. I used the exact same camera settings and just angled the camera up higher because the foreground blurred out. So there's no point in having a bunch of foreground in your photo if it's gonna be blurry. And in fact, this was taken years ago when I really didn't have my full concepts down. If I were to come back out here next week, for example, I would go to an area without all these big trees in the frame. That way I have a clear view of the night sky, and that's ultimately gonna make my blending a lot easier. And I recommend you do that as well. 
again, don't set up your tracker in the same spot as your tripod because then whatever interesting foregun you have is just going to blur out and make your blending a lot harder. So whenever possible, find a nearby wide open parking lot or something else. Set up your star tracker there. And if you have a clearer view of the night sky, it'll go a long way to giving you a better photo. Anyway, I just wanted to explain what this photo was. Now that we've looked at both photos and I've made my adjustments, I need to sync the settings between both photos. And if you use the exact same camera settings, then this will work really well. The way we'll do that is hold down the control or command key and select one of our other thumbnails here. And then I'll hit this little button with the little sliders and the refresh looking icon. Alternatively, you can right click and sync settings. That'll do the same thing. When this window comes up, just hit OK. And there we go. The whole point of that was to sync our settings between both photos. That way they have the same edits applied and this should all go a lot more smoothly. The last thing we need to do is get these loaded up into Adobe Photoshop. So what you want to do is hold down the controller command key again, click on both photos so they're both highlighted, and then hold down the shift key. When you hold down the shift key, you'll notice that open changes to open objects. Again, if you hold down shift, click open objects, this will bring you into Photoshop now, and we can begin the blending process. And today we are going to be using Lumenzia from Greg Benz. Before we get to that though, we need to put both of our images in the same workspace. And generally, you want to do this a certain way to verify that we are maintaining the smart object status. A smart object is notated by this little document sign over here on our thumbnail. And what a smart object is, is basically I can double click on this thumbnail whenever I want to. After I've double clicked on the thumbnail, it'll bring me right back to Adobe Camera Raw and I can make any adjustments that I want to the raw data. Maybe I accidentally screwed something up or it just doesn't look right. I can always come back and adjust it and then hit OK. That's the power of these smart objects and that's really going to come in handy in a few minutes. All right, now that we've explained smart objects, we need to, again, get both of these photos in the same workspace. And I generally want to grab the sharp stars image with the move tool over on the left. That's the four way arrow. With the move tool selected, I can click, drag this image up to this tab, like in Internet Explorer, or whatever uh, browser you use, there should be tabs. And once I drag down, I can let go and then move it around. That usually takes beginners a lot of uh, practice to get the hang of that, but it's not that hard. Again, just click and drag this up to the other tab, drag it down, and then let go of your mouse button, and then move it around until the pink lines indicate you have it centered up. If you did all that correctly, you should now have two layers over on the right, and you can turn on and off the eyeball for the top layer and make sure that things are in the correct order. This is when things start to get confusing though, so we should probably rename these layers. If we double click on the name, this top one, we'll call that the sky. Then I'll hit the tab key, and now I'll name the bottom layer foreground. That just helps us stay organized. So we have sky on top, foreground on the bottom. In order to have a correct layer structure, we need to duplicate the foreground layer. And I'll right click on the name and choose duplicate layer near the top of the list. You can name this foreground copy. That's actually what I recommend. And then hit OK. Now we have foreground, foreground copy, sky. But I want the foreground copy on top of the sky layer. So I'll click on it, drag it up until I see the blue line, and then let go. Now we have our proper layer structure, which is always going to be foreground copy, sky in the middle, foreground. If you're a little bit confused right now, you might want to pause the video, go back and rewatch the last few minutes, and then pick back up with us. For everybody else, we're ready to begin our blending. And this is where you can use any application you want. In the past, I used the Easy Panel, which works pretty well. It's also free. Today, though, I wanted to demo Lumenzia because I know a lot of you have this one and it works pretty well. Regardless of the application you're using, they're all going to have largely the same functionality. You're going to see usually like darks, or in this case, it's abbreviated D, midtones, which is abbreviated M, and then lights, which is abbreviated L. These are luminosity masks, and all that really means is that they're going to make a layer mask based on the brightness of your photo. So if we used a light mask, I'll just click on the L button, and it says I need to convert to 16 bits. What it's going to do now is analyze the scene to identify the brightest areas, and then it will select them. 
and here we go. If you're still a beginner, this is gonna be very confusing because you're just seeing shades of gray. The way you wanna think about this is anything black or almost black, that's not gonna be selected. Anything white or a bright gray will be selected. And ultimately our only goal here with these luminosity masks is to select either the sky or the foreground. In other words, I want the sky to be completely white, the foreground to be completely black, or vice versa. With Lumenzia, we've got a lot of functionality. So that was just clicking on the L button, right? If I click on L2, it's gonna make the masks darker. L3 will make it even darker. That just means it's selecting less and less. Remember, in this case, only really the fire and this light on Mount Hood are gonna be selected in some of the stars. Everything else is black, will not be selected. And the way you wanna think about this is very simple. Start clicking on L, one, two, three, four, five, six, and see if you can get any real contrast between the sky and the foreground. In this case, there's nothing. So the lights aren't working for me. No big deal. I can click the X button, and that'll wipe everything out. We're back to step one. We know the lights didn't work. Let's try the darks now. I'll just click on the D button. Now the mask looks completely different. The foreground is completely white, which means it's gonna be selected, but the fire and the light are completely black, which means they won't be selected. So the dark masks are only targeting the dark areas of the photo. There's still not a lot of contrast though between the sky and the foreground. Let's try darks too. That's better, the sky's a little bit darker. We can try darks three. That's looking even better, darks four. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Hopefully this is starting to make sense now. Again, I want the sky completely black in this case, the foreground completely white. And while you're doing this, you really wanna pay attention to the most detailed portion of your horizon. In this case, all these pine trees, all these little individual branches and things, that's where you're gonna have a nightmare when it comes to the blending. And that makes this area the most important. This is where I need the most clear contrast between the sky and the foreground, because I can't come in here and spend a week manually painting out every little edge. On the other hand, we have Mount Hood over here. This is a very clean, simple horizon. And I can come in here with a quick selection tool and tag this in less than a second. So I don't care if there's a lot of contrast here because I know I can fix this manually. And this is why the luminosity masks are so powerful because they allow you to pull out the contrast and detail in these really complicated areas, which would be impossible to do otherwise. Getting back on track, I think we're on darks five right now. Let's click darks five and make sure. No, we are on darks four. All right, so there's darks five and then finally dark six. Some of you might be thinking, okay, darks five is probably our best bet because the foreground is white, the sky is black. However, if we come up over here, you can see we're really starting to push it and the trees are almost getting too dark. And this is where you just have to find the fine line between what works and what doesn't. And that's up to you to practice on your own to get the hang of this. Me, personally, I think I'm gonna stick with darks four. That gives me enough contrast and I can further tweak this however I need to. Now that I've found the layer mask that I think is gonna work, I can begin making my adjustments. Just to recap, the way you're gonna do this whole process, regardless of the luminosity mask software you're using, is just click on darks one, two, three, four, five, six, or lights one, two, three, four, five, six, and look at your photo. Make sure you pay attention to the complicated area on your horizon and pick the mask that gives you the most contrast without accidentally deleting or covering up the fine details. Once you've found that layer mask, then you need to begin the uh, process of refining it. And there's a lot of ways you can do this. There's even a refine option down here. That's one of the nice things about Lumenzia that you do have a lot of functionality. But in the interest of keeping this video as simple as possible, I'm just gonna hit mask. That will create a layer mask based on our current selection. Now I know this looks like a giant mess, don't worry about that. There's an important key combination you're gonna to need to know. If you hold down the Alt or Option key if you're on a Mac, you can click on our layer mask that we have right here. Again, hold down Alt or Option and click the little black and white icon over on the right. If you did that correctly, you should now be looking at the layer mask that we created with the help of Lumenzia. At this point, we need to get the foreground completely white and the sky completely black. The easiest way to do that is to grab a brush tool from the left. You can just hit the B key for brush. And then over on the left, you're also gonna have these black and white squares. 
If they're not black and white, you can hit the X key to swap back and forth. And then in this case, I'll start off with white as the top color. I want to make the brush size a little bit bigger, maybe about that big. And my main goal again is just to make the foreground completely white. So I'm just going to start painting it in. I need to be careful though, because if I go up and get too close to the horizon, I can just screw everything up like that. And that's why you want to play this safe. Stay far away from the horizon. Just get the easy to reach areas that you see here, like so. And that's probably good enough. The foreground is now largely white, but we still need to get the sky black. I can hit the X key to swap to the black, or just come down here and do it. And now I'll paint in the sky. Hopefully this is starting to make sense now what we're actually doing, because I know it's kind of really weird if you're still new to editing, especially in Photoshop and the luminosity masks, that's a whole other thing. Really though, it comes down to just basically making one area white, one area black. There's not much more to it than that. All right, so we've gotten the easy to reach areas. I don't want to get any closer to the horizon because I might screw something up. Now let's take care of Mount Hood because this is a very easy area to clean out. The way I'll do that is click back on my layer thumbnail right here. Because it is so blurry looking right now, if I turn off the eyeballs for the top two layers, I'm only looking at my original foreground now, which is another reason why you want to keep this layer structure. With my original foreground, the only one that's visible, I can grab the quick selection tool from the left. It's going to look like a little brush with a lasso tool behind it. With the quick selection tool selected, and a fairly decent size thing there, I can just draw out below the mountain. And you can see it automatically snapped to this selection. I can also zoom in and make sure it actually got everything I wanted it to. If you're doing this and it accidentally goes up into the sky like that, you can either Command Z and undo it, or if you hold down the Alt or Option key, this little plus inside of there will turn to a minus. So if you hold down the Alt or Option key, you can now click and drag to remove certain selections like you see here. That's kind of tricky though, so it'll take some practice to get the hang of this, but there we go, it's close enough. With Mount Hood cleanly selected, I can now continue painting in that area. And the way we'll do that is we'll turn on our eyeballs again, for both of our top layers, hold down the Alter Option key and click on our layer mask so we can see it again. Then I'll use a white paintbrush, zoom in, and paint this in. And because we have the marching ants there, I cannot accidentally paint it in the sky, which is exactly what I want. However, over here on the edges, we have all these little tiny individual trees. So if I were to start painting in like this, it's really going to mess up the horizon over here. And I don't want to do that. So anyway, going back to here, there we go. This is already starting to look pretty good for our blend, although it still needs a lot more work. And if we hold down the Alter Option key one more time and click on our layer mask, we get another preview. We've got most of our work done. The only thing left is targeting these really precise areas in the sky and the foreground. So our goal right now, just to recap, is to paint in the foreground with white, the sky with black, without destroying all these fine branches in detail. And the trick to this, well, one of the tricks anyway, is to use dodge and burn. Kind of like in the old film days, we're going to dodge, it's going to make the whites whiter. Burn is going to make the blacks blacker in this case. That's the way you want to think about it. So dodge is bright, burn is dark. And there's no right or wrong way to do this. I'm going to start off with dodge though. And then up top, we have a range. You can choose shadows, midtones, or highlights. Obviously, in this case, we want to select the highlights to make them brighter. Then you have the exposure. This is up to you to choose what you want to use. I recommend keeping it around 50 to 80, and you can always adjust it. Lastly, we have the size. You want something fairly big, but not too big, because you do want some control. With all that dialed in, and our dodge tool still selected, we can now just paint in the foreground. And just like that, we're making a lot brighter and whiter, which is what we need. And I can just grab all that real quick. If we think that looks good, we'll zoom in and just verify that the trees are actually selected all the way. And then we could swap over to the burn tool just by clicking and holding and changing to burn. With the burn tool selected, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to choose the range as shadows. 
and everything else you can just adjust as needed the size and the exposure and then we'll paint in the sky like so and make sure you really go up there in case you missed any areas from before but you're starting to realize this is kind of a balancing act if i go too heavy on the burning i'm going to erase some of the finer details on these trees and that's going to be a problem so you do want to do this uh, a little bit more slowly than you might want to initially do just take your time put the effort in and this is really what's going to take your foot at the next level is having this really clean realistic looking blend that nobody would even know you did and all i'm doing right now is just burning the sky to make it completely black we got the easy area over on the left now comes the more difficult area over here because there's a lot more fine detail and again, I'll probably start off with the dodging tool to make this brighter. Just tag the trees really fast like this so they don't get overexposed. Or rather, the sky doesn't get overexposed. And if you have some real stubborn areas like over here in these trees where it's almost black, you can always try and paint that out manually with a brush later on. We're just trying to get all the fine detail on the horizon. So with a little bit more work, that's good enough. I'm not going to sit here and make you watch me do this whole thing because I just want to explain the, the technique. Now that the trees are white, we can swap over to the burn tool. And again, we'll make the sky dark. And you'd want to be a little bit more cautious about this than I am. I'm just trying to show you the basic principle today. This is obviously going to be a lot more difficult if your foreground is lit up along the edges. You know, if you have a bright light shining on these trees, you're not going to have that extreme contrast that I do here. And that's going to throw a wrench in your plans. We do talk about some things you can try in the Astro post-processing course. And for a lot of these videos in there, I also include my raw photos. So you can follow along with us step-by-step -step and practice, even if you don't have your own images yet. And therefore, once you finally do have them, it'll be a lot easier to pick up and start running with. If you think you're all done, then the last thing you do is just click off the layer mask. You can just click anywhere on your layer. And there we go. The way to test your layer mask is to turn on and off the eyeball for this foreground copy layer. And if you do that, I mean, you shouldn't really see anything over here. In this case, I'm actually turning off the sky layer. That really uh, gives us a better look. So here's before the blending and after. We've lost a little bit of detail on those trees. You see that? That's why I tried to warn you, if you go too heavy on the, the burning especially, if these aren't pure white, they're not going to come through as well. You can always come back with a dodge tool and try and fill them back in. And now if we do this before and after, they're a little bit more full now, right? So that looks better. There are some ways where you can also make this selection a little bit more fuller and blur it out so it doesn't look as pixelated like you see here. For more information, again, check out my Astro Post Processing course. We don't have time to get into that today. That's a whole nother video. Uh, in general, though, this looks fairly good. There's our before here and after. And there's really no way to do this without luminosity masks. I mean, you could probably buy some fancy software that'll do this like Luminar, but I don't really have much experience with that and I don't know how it would work for these really delicate, complicated scenes like you see here. Now, one of the comments I get a lot on this particular image is that the lake no longer matches the sky. Obviously, we have the trailed stars and that doesn't match what we see here. That's a valid point because this lake just adds another level of complexity to the image. You could do a fake blend where you kind of like reverse the sky down here in the lake. Again, that would be a whole nother video though. And that's something we actually do talk about in the Astro Post Processing course, if you did want to check that out. In this case though, you know, I, I have photographed around a lot of lakes and you're never really going to get a crisp reflection because the water is usually moving. I mean, maybe you find a small pond or something that there's no wind. Uh, generally though, I mean, I'm not too worried about the lake there. And overall, all things considered, it looks pretty good. The final thing I want to touch on is the problem that almost everybody's going to have, especially if they're a beginner. When they do their blend, it's going to look something like this, where they have the clean, detailed foreground, but behind it is all this blurred out crap. That's because they took both photos in the exact same location, one with the tracker, one without. And that's where you run into all these problems where the blurred trees are now visible in the background. The only solution, unfortunately, is to either move your sky layer down so that way the blurred out trees and things are no longer visible. 
And that brings it with it its own set of problems because now the Milky Way is no longer accurate. You know, see how it doesn't line up anymore. Or you can leave it where it needs to be, somewhere up over here, let's say. And then you can start cloning out the sky. I don't really recommend doing that though because you're gonna have a bunch of fake stars and it might look kind of messy. You can probably pull it off in some hard to see areas, but that's really not an ideal solution. Therefore, moving ahead, the most important thing you can do is to take your tracked sky exposure, which we see right here. Again, go out to a, a calm, clear area where there's no big trees or buildings or power lines or anything in the way. Set up your star tracker there and just capture the sky. Try and get 90% sky, 10% foreground. Then when you do this blending, you have a nice clean transition between the two and nobody will ever know that you even did a blend if you do it correctly. And that's all I've got for you in today's video. We looked at how to use Lumenzia to do a basic blend of a sky and foreground image. The big takeaway from that is you're gonna click on darks from one all the way to six or lights one through six until you find the mask that gives you the most contrast. Your ultimate goal is to get the sky completely black, the foreground completely white. And if you can do that, you should be in good shape. The other thing we talked about at the beginning of the video is that depending on your camera's sensor, you might have to do some different techniques. I've always found it works really well to take a single long exposure for your foreground, which you see right here, and then a single long exposure for the sky with the help of a star tracker. For me, this gives really clean, detailed results, especially if I'm shooting about four or five minutes. However, for some cameras out there, in this case, the Nikon D7200, which is a small crop sensor camera, when uh, Simeon, in this case, he's the one who took these photos, he sent them over to me because he was having some trouble. When he sent these over to me, he was shooting about five minutes. And I could probably guess it was a very hot night too, just by the amount of hot pixels. But because he didn't use long exposure noise reduction, the hot pixels were baked into the photo, and now it's gonna be a nightmare to remove. If he would have turned on long exposure noise reduction in camera though, he would have had to wait another five minutes, but the end result would have been much cleaner. So that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching. And if you wanna learn more, be sure to check out the courses on my website, which will teach you how to use your star tracker properly and how to edit your photos in case you're still having some trouble.